Well, today we are continuing our conversation on faith. Our series is called A Simple Guide to Walking on Water. And I just know that whatever it is that you're facing in life, you need faith. Today, I want to talk about, one, yeah, that you don't have to worry, that things are going to be okay, and more than anything, to not just settle for whatever you currently have, but to dream and to think bigger. That faith is not just praying for what you need, it's praying for what you want. Faith is saying that maybe, maybe this is what I have right now, but God has something bigger. So if you hear anything I say today, it's this. Take a risk for God. Take a risk for God. To walk by faith and become the kind of person whose vision is framed by what God wants. That I'm going to do things that are big enough to say, only God could do something that awesome, that amazing. I am going to take a risk for the Lord. You know, very often when we get comfortable in life, I am convinced God likes to take us to scary places. God doesn't like us being all that comfortable. He doesn't like it when we get stuck in the ruts. When I was a kid, I had a big fear of water, and that's a problem growing up in the summer, especially here in Southern California. And I remember once I was at the beach with my parents and a couple of my friends, and the waves were particularly big that day. And I was maybe eight or nine years old. I was still a kid. But I saw all my other you know, friends going out in the water, and they were swimming, and they were having a good time, and they were getting beat up by the waves. And I was just sitting going, oh, that's interesting. And my dad goes, go out there and play with them. And I said, oh, that's, you know, I'm all right. <laughs> and my dad's like, well, they're having fun without you. They're asking you to go out there. Go out and play with them. I'm like, dad, I'm fine. He goes, you're scared of those waves, aren't you? It's like, I am not scared of those humongous waves. <laughs> and without a word, this makes my dad sound like such a jerk. He's not. He's a sweet guy. Without a word, he was working out then too. I want to say he was 36 and his biceps were like. <laughs> he reaches over and like just with one arm, grabs me like this and slowly, which is torture, you know. Like as soon as he comes close, I try to get up to get away because I know it's going to happen. And just with one slow arm, just takes me like this and starts walking towards the water. <laughs> like, you know, Goliath or something. And I'm going, no, God, no. I'm totally like, this is not an exaggeration. Full on screaming, clawing. I'm trying to go for his eyes. He's holding me like this. And these waves, at the time, I felt like they were 10 feet higher. They're probably a foot. But anyway, he's taking me into the water. And he's like, all right, here's what you got to do. Here comes a big one. You got to dip underwater when it comes. And I'm like, no, please, no. And then the wave comes, and he goes, Poof. Just like, uh, you know, some kind of a Superman, like right into the wave. And I just get nailed by this wave. And he goes, all right, are you OK? I'm like, no, I hate you. And he goes, OK, here comes another one. And this keeps happening over and over until finally he's like, just watch. This is what you do. And he just walked me through it. And he stayed with me, holding me with this big, big arm. So this big, you know, burly man. And he just said, we're going to stay here until you're not afraid of these waves anymore. And that's exactly what happened. And by the time, by the time we finished, I was not that afraid of waves anymore. <laughs> you know? But it, it really, it, it helped. And, and this is an analogy, I think, to what God and his fatherliness, you know, God, it's important that we don't align a gender to God because God's not a man, as the scriptures teach us, but... There is, a, there is definitely this fatherliness to God where he will challenge and push and bring us into places that we're not always comfortable going so that we can grow. You know, there is something about a nagging fear, like a looming fear that you never have to face that in its own way is very painful, you know? And so I think that God does this. So, and what I want to say to you is this. Maybe you're feeling dragged into the ocean. 
Maybe you're feeling dragged into the waves, but God is teaching you how to be the kind of person to abide rough waters. You don't feel strong enough now to endure what you're going through, but you are. God is showing you and proving to you that you don't have to be afraid of waves, that you have everything you need to endure the storm. You do. You have it. You have everything you need to endure the storm. And God is not the kind of God that throws you into the ocean. He walks in with you. He carries you. He makes sure that you feel those everlasting arms when those waves are coming. Do you feel them? No matter what you're going through, you are not alone. And I want you to know it's going to be okay. And you can live with faith for today. And you can keep taking risks. And you can keep doing great things for God. And you'll thrive. The scripture reading today was the famous one about actually walking on water. And it was the passage about Peter walking on water. And if you've been to this church at all, you know this. That in Judaism, especially in the first century, when Jesus said, follow me, to follow a rabbi didn't mean to just go where the rabbi goes. It meant to do what the rabbi does. If you were called to be a disciple of a rabbi, you were being trained to be a rabbi yourself. You can actually see this today in Orthodox Judaism. If you go to Jerusalem, you will actually see an older rabbi and a bunch of younger boys in their teens following behind him, doing everything that he does. And in Jesus' day, to follow a rabbi meant to do everything the rabbi does. So if the rabbi writes left-handed, you need to learn to write left-handed. If the rabbi tells jokes, you need to start telling jokes. They would literally... Like, if there would be footprints in the sand, they would step, sometimes, in the actual footprints of their, of their rabbi. So they, they were trying to become clones of the rabbi that they were following. And this is the most important thing to note. That for rabbis in Jesus' day, disciples were intended to do all the things the rabbi did. And the reason this matters is you start to see in the Gospels, these young men who are following Jesus, all of a sudden are called to do some pretty crazy things. Like in Luke 9 and 10, he tells them to just go out and start healing people and don't take anything with you. Like, he just says, go heal them. And he gives them all these instructions. Go cast out demons. Go do all this stuff. And they go and do it. And they come back and he says, were you successful? He said, Lord, even the demons bow in your name. So they begin to do, through the story, all these amazing things. Well, this story of Peter walking on water is just that. It's Peter responding to the idea that disciples are supposed to do what rabbis do. So it was after the feeding of the 5,000, this famous story, Jesus says, I'm going to dismiss everyone now that they've eaten, and I want you to go out on the boat, and I'll, I'll meet you out there. I don't know if he says that, but this is certainly what's going to happen. So they go out on the boat. Jesus dismisses everyone, and he goes up on the mountain to pray, and now it's nighttime, and the wind is blowing. It's so important to understand what water means for Jews in the first century, too. For, for many people back then, there's a mystic quality to water. Because wherever you find water, you find life. But there's also a scary thing about water. When there were big bodies of water, they believed, some, that it was actually a gateway to hell. In fact, many people back then not only uh, couldn't swim, but didn't swim because they were afraid of the Leviathan which was essentially like the Loch Ness Monster. We'll just shoot straight, okay? That there's some kind of Loch Ness Monster in the Sea of Galilee. And that when this sort of monster demon thing gets angry, it starts to swirl up weather and, and the water. So there's this big looming fear. It's very likely most of these guys, I know it seems crazy because they're fishermen, there's a good chance that they couldn't swim. In fact, I'm willing to bet they couldn't swim. And there was a spiritual dimension that they believed that this big body of water was a gateway to hell. And so, so, they're out on the boat. And Jesus is up on the hill, and the storm starts swirling. And the wind starts blowing. And it says they're not able to get back to shore. They're trying to get back, but the wind is pushing their boat away from the shore. And it's nighttime. So they're already freaked out, right? And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus. On the water, walking. And they see him, and at first they, they get totally terrified... They think it's a ghost or a spirit or something. They're, they're about to lose their minds. And Jesus says, oh, it's me, guys. Hey, I'm just walking on water. 
So they see this miracle. They see Jesus in one of his most famous miracles, walking on water. They all see it. They all write about it. And then, the, in a way, the more amazing thing happens. Peter says to Jesus, Lord, ask me to come out to you and I will. And Jesus says, come. Now here's the amazing thing. Peter gets out of the boat and he begins to walk on water to Jesus. One step at a time. It's dark. The wind is blowing. The rain is coming down. His friends behind him are watching. What would it feel like, by the way, to get out and start walking on water towards Jesus? I wonder. And so he's walking, and he begins to doubt, and he begins to get afraid, and he takes his eyes off of Christ, and he begins to put them on the waves, and he begins to sink. And I picture him sinking slowly, like he's sinking into jello instead of water. I don't know. And the story says that Jesus reaches down and he grabs him. And the scripture says, Jesus says to him, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Do you know what he means there when he's saying, why did you doubt? He's saying, why did you doubt that you could do what I can do? That's exactly right. Everybody that, re- that studies the scriptures, that reads the scripture, this is the right way to read this text. Not, you know, why did you doubt in this? It's why did you doubt that you could walk on water just like me? I've called you. I said, come. If I ask you to do something, I'm going to give you Everything you need to accomplish it, even if it means walking on water. That if God says, come walk on water, he's going to give you the shoes you need to walk on water. He's just going to give you what you need to stay afloat. This is faith. So if God says, come, take a risk, get out of the boat. You can do the things Jesus did. He says that, not me. In fact, he says in John chapter 14, greater things than these will you do because I'm going to my father. I believe that. So why do you doubt? Why do you doubt? So I'm asking you, train your fear into faith by taking a risk for God today. By taking a risk. If you've been knocked down, I want to ask you, have faith and get back up. Because great things are in store for you. You only lose when you decide not to get back up again. Faith is trust. Very simply, faith is trusting God. You need to be a risk taker. You need to be a person of faith to get where you need to go. God's not going to force you to go where you need to go. Sometimes you're going to have to face your fears. Sometimes you're going to have to take a risk. Recently, we went to Holland with my sister, Brittany. And uh, this is a perfect story. My sister, Brittany, is terrified of flying. Terrified. And uh, in fact, it had been years and years Uh, since she'd been on a plane, and she'd never been to Europe, and I invited her to go with us on our Holland tour, and finally she had to face the music. So she got her tickets, she got a passport, and she said for like days before the flight she couldn't sleep. But she decided, I'm going to get on that plane, and I don't care if I scream, if I pass out. She had a couple glasses of wine. She didn't lie (laughs) before she took off. But she got on that plane. She got on that plane, and she got to Holland, and she saw old windmills, and she ate cow to cheese and strope waffles, and saw all these handsome blonde men that were taller than 6'5". And, <laughs> and listen, this is a perfect analogy for all of us. I'm so proud of my sister because so much of the human experience is doing things like that. Many of you, you're afraid to go to rehab. Some of you, you're afraid to start dating again. Some of you, you're so embarrassed about your divorce. Some of you, this is maybe your first time back in church, or maybe you're watching on TV, and you you were so hurt by religion, you think, I can never be plugged into a church again. Take a risk. Take a risk. Some of you have been wearing a mask for a long time and pretending to be somebody that you're not. I want to encourage you to be authentic, be genuine, take a risk in faith. And watch as you become a happier, fuller person. I just want to finish with this. I actually had a rough day a couple weeks ago. And it was just hard. And so I felt like the Lord called me to the ocean. So I went to the ocean, and it was, you know, getting darker. It was twilight. And there were these waves. And I put on some gym shorts because I didn't have swim trunks. And I just went out into the water to swim. 
And the water was warm for California, still cool. But I began to just, to just pray, and I was sort of swimming out in the water. And I was remembering as a teenager in college all the times I went surfing and all the fun I'd had, and I began to, you know, uh, began to body surf. I did lose my trunks one time. It was okay. <laughs> just put them right back on. But I remember just floating out there in the water, and I remember thinking about God's grace and that living through life is a lot like surfing on grace. You know, grace doesn't mean mercy. You know that, right? Grace doesn't mean mercy. Grace means an overflow of God's favor, power, and love. It's so, we've limited it to this thing like, oh, grace means forgiveness. So much more than that. Jesus received grace when he was baptized, not for the forgiveness of sins, but for the empowerment to to do what God had called him to do, do what the Father had called him to do. Jesus was God. And so many of us, living life is like surfing on grace. When, you, when surfers are out on the water, they're always looking for a wave, you know? And they're always looking for a big wave. And you miss it all the time. Sometimes you're too far out, or sometimes you're too far in. And, but there's always another wave. And sometimes you wipe out, but that just means you weren't ready. You didn't go fast enough, or you're not trained enough. But most importantly, the thing you learn when you're surfing is that even if there aren't waves, you're still enjoying it. Because there's something about the gentle rhythm of waves coming in and out that lifts you and drops you. The company of people, the refreshing nature of water itself. And so many of you, you're you're in life and you've completely wiped out. I just want to say to you, it's okay. Another wave is coming, huh? And know that even as you're just sort of sitting and resting on the water, that grace is sustaining you, grace is holding you, that whether or not you're surfing or not, there is this, like water, this sustaining nature that no matter where you are, you are not alone. God is holding you, and it will be okay. Some of you have failed miserably recently in some area of your life, and I just want to say to you, just because you fail doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means... You haven't succeeded yet. It's going to be okay. And I want to encourage you to become the kind of person that lives in faith, that never quits and never gives up. God is calling you to do great things for him. So be vulnerable. Take a risk. And and, and be the kind of person that God has called you to be. In Jesus' name. Amen.